In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 32 points at 74.89. The pound buys $1.21 and €1.16. LBC weather, snow and sleet showers in Scotland overnight. Some rain in the east with lows of minus 5. Wintry showers for northern England tomorrow. Drier elsewhere with highs of 6 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's two minutes past eight on LBC. This is the fourth last cross question before Christmas. Can you believe? Doesn't time go quickly? Uh, on our panel tonight, we have Rachel Shabby, journalist and author, Matt Warman, Conservative MP for Boston and Skegness. Uh, to my right, Emma Sinclair, tech entrepreneur. She's chief executive of Enterprise Alumni. And Claire Hanna, Social Democratic and Labour Party MP for Belfast South. They're here to answer your questions and to ask a question question all you need to do is phone 0345 6060 973 you can text your question to 84850 and you can use alexa just say alexa send a comment to lbc and do please watch us on global player call 0345 6060 973 tweet at lbc text 84850 cross question with ian dale this is lbc I love you, LBC, says Helen from Hounslow. We love you too, Helen. Thank you very much indeed. We, we don't always get such nice texts as that, I have to tell you. But hopefully we'll get some more during the course of this hour. Welcome to you all. Let's go to our first caller. It's Paul in Blackburn. Hello, Paul. Hello, Ian. Right, I'd like to ask a question to the panel. If MPs are offered an inflation-busting pay rise, which they say the public sector can't have... Should or would MPs take it next year? Right, so if MPs are recommended an inflation-busting pay rise, which the government says public sector, public sector workers cannot have, would they and should they accept the pay rise? Um, Matt Warman, that, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the IPSA who decide these things, didn't they decide that there should be a, a, a reasonable pay rise recently and MPs rejected it? Well, well that, that, that is that. right. MPs have uh, got a track record of turning down uh, pay rises since it became independently set. But actually what Ipsa have said they'll do subsequently is they will suggest the average of the public sector pay change, whatever that might be. So uh, unless uh, there is a significant change in government policy to suggest inflation-busting pay rises, the situation that's been suggested simply won't arise. And I think, look, it's right that MPs don't decide their own pay. It's right that it's independently set. All, all of that stuff is sort of a given. Um, but there's a broader question here about pay restraint being the right thing to do up to a certain point, uh, Parliament has to be reasonable about what does what does pay restraint look like in the public sector when inflation is still uh, a really significant factor, and if at the end of the day that is reflected. The the, la the last pay rise for MPs, I think I'm right in saying, was two percent, wasn't it? But yes. um, I don't know how long ago that was. And, and, and previously, it was it was zero percent because mm. uh, a number of MPs wrote to Ipsa and suggested. But of course people will say well 2% of 81,000 is, is actually a lot more than 2% if you're on 25,000. In, indeed and you could make the same case for well paid public servants such as head teachers, such as doctors, such as a whole host of uh, other people. The, the debate about MPs pay is an important thing obviously it's an important thing but it is ultimately a sideshow in the grand scheme of the public finances. What we should be doing is having a sensible conversation about how does the government get inflation under under control so that we are not having a conversation about what is a sensible way of having a pay rise for people in the public sector that tries to mitigate. Rachel Shabby, you're not an MP but... Uh... I'm not an MP and I think it's ridiculous to suggest that inflation is caused by public sector pay. I mean obviously public sector pay has stagnated for the last 12 years all the while inflation has gone up so to suggest that one has caused the other is borderline well, hang, well, hang ludicrous. On. If, if, hang on, I haven't finished. The other thing I would say is that why is the government say, saying that public sector cannot have a pay rise? Why is that? Because we simply cannot afford it. It's not cutting it when so many organisations, mm. including Tax Justice UK, have said, you know, there are ways that you could fund this. You could tax the wealthy. Mm. You could generate £37 billion by five 
tax measures that Tax mm. Justice UK have suggested. You've got millionaires in this country asking to be taxed more. You won't do it for ideological reasons. It's nothing to do with the economy, and I just wish you would at least have the honesty to admit that. Well, so, so I, I think... So two things. You, you are right that there is a much more left-wing argument that says you could just whack up taxes, you could just have uh, more people paying uh, more money. The reality is that actually what Jeremy Hunt and what Rishi Sunak, Sunak did previously was to increase the tax burden on the best off uh, in this country. That's where you have uh, got a lot of that. And it, it is, the reality is it is simply wishful thinking to say there are enough really well-off people in this country that could solve the challenges that we face. And, and look, we so, to some extent, I wish it were true. I, I'd, I'd love to be sitting here saying, oh, we can just take more off people who can spare it. But if that were the case, then people would be doing it around the world. Well, people are doing it around All the right. world, and it is just a fundamental misunderstanding of how the economy works. If you do not understand the simple fact that the way you improve the economy is to pump more money into it through well, wages that people then spend on, on other businesses, that other businesses grow that is how you grow an economy. That's the reason it hasn't grown for the last 12 years. No, no, no. Thanks no, to you no, no we have two other panelists. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we're going to get I it think, on I think we want to hear from them as well. Um, Emma Sinclair, let's start with you. Now, you've got a business background. You, I do. You do. look on these discussions probably in a bit of a different way. I, I do. And I look on these conversations that I had in a different way as well. I say we all exist in different worlds. I would say when I run a business, I like to think about action. I like to think about responsibility. I like to think about outcomes. Um, if I was in the playground or the office, I would be trying to spend not too much time on who's to blame and be spending lots of time on how we can move forward and do the very best we can. Um, as regards specifically to the question about MPs pay, I mean, Matt's the man to uh, have to take that one. But I will say that we all want to recruit the best of the best wherever we are. And if there is one particular type of public servant that feels embarrassed to ever take a pay rise. I, I do think that that then lends itself to the question where people are asking, are we attracting the absolute right people into mm -hmm. government? So um, I, I just would be, love for a lot of matters that really matter to people, which is the state of the economy, to be forward facing and think about solutions as opposed to um, as opposed to blame and, and, and who caused the wrong. That would be my approach. Okay. Um, Claire Hannah, I'm going to bring an, another question in for you. Uh, Michal has tweeted this question. Do the panel agree, and you can all feel free to chip in on this too, do the panel agree that pay for members of the Northern Ireland Assembly should stop immediately after today's fifth failure to form an executive instalment? Now, you used to be an MLA, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did, and I can, uh, and in fact, it will. We passed legislation this week that um, the Secretary of State has taken power to, to cut the pay, and I think that's appropriate because cut it, uh, cut, cut it because they the MLAs aren't um, doing all the parts of their job, uh, and particularly when other people are under pressure and, and other people are losing pay because they're not going to work uh, for reasons of, of striking. It's appropriate, but just following on from the point, we are trying to um, attract people uh, into politics, and that has made it a little bit harder in Northern Ireland. And I, as you say, was an MLA in suspension and my pay was cut due to the intransigence of others. And it's difficult when you're trying to attract, you know, high caliber people who are in it for the right reasons. And you say, and by the way, a few months every year, your pay will go down to this because mm. another party is having a protest. We proposed an amendment to that legislation that would direct uh, that cut at the one party that's present preventing the formation um, of an assembly because essentially there's a ransom tactic that's, that's, uh, that's being played and out. How much to are all MLAs paid? Uh, MLAs are paid, I think, 51,000, and there's a proposal that it'll, they'll be cut by, I think, 36,000. And it's still, it's a, it's a, it's a decent wage, no doubt. Uh, and as I say, they're unable to carry out the full function, so they won't be working all the hours uh, that, that an MLA normally um, w w would be. But but as I say, people people do have commitments and people will, you know, have challenges with their childcare or their, or, or their mortgage. But it is, it is appropriate and it's symbolic, but in the longer term, um, when we're trying to essentially change the bums and seats and change the political culture uh, in, in Northern Ireland, um, it, it, it probably doesn't help. As I say, uh, I, I think if it's being used as leverage, it should be directed on the one party um, who, are, who are preventing us moving and forward. And on the original and, and question on MPs pay? 
Yeah, look, I, I think uh, uh, clearly it's in uh, IPSA and independently mediated uh, for, for a reason, but really the public conversation is other uh, public servants who aren't so well remunerated as MPs. And um, yes, there are obviously... Uh, if, financial and economic uh, parameters, but this has been brewing for, for a decade and people haven't um, been properly looked after uh, and haven't, haven't received appropriate pay rises um, over over the good years as well. And and, and there was an inevitable uh, push on that and um, it, it is solvable. I think the trade unions are, are, are negotiators by trade uh, and they uh, are up for having that uh, conversation. But, um, uh, you know, essentially uh, they are the closest to the ground in terms of public serv- uh, services. They they can see the, the rot um, that's in and, and and they know certainly in terms of NHS, which is what we were discussing in the chamber um, yesterday. Uh, the, the the poor remuneration is contributing to, to those services falling apart because people are, are are burnt out and are are driven into uh, other parts of the health service. And if you don't sort out the pay, you're not going to sort out those issues. Let's um, add another question into this, an Alexa question from Chris, who says, would it not be appropriate to set up an independent pay board for public sector pay, like the one which decides MPs pay? Well, well, there are pay boards on public sector. I mean, the health service, for example, the government... I mean, Rachel, I'd be interested in your views on this. The, the government have accepted the recommendations of the NHS pay body. I think they were recommending 5%, and the government have accepted that. Now, obviously, inflation is a lot more than that, so naturally, the Royal College of Nursing and other unions aren't very happy. But if you have an independent pay board and you accept the recommendation, I mean, the government say, well, we, we've done what we're supposed to do. What's the problem? Yeah, I think that is a really interesting question. And and I think the answer is exactly in what you're suggesting, that it is, you know, it's so far below the rate of inflation that you're actually asking these staff to take a pay cut. And I think there's there's two problems here for the government. One is that it's very difficult to drum up opposition to... Um, people who are on strike, including rail workers, postal workers, nurses, ambulance workers, who just recently, you know, we have this huge public sentiment of gratitude for their service to the nation. It's very difficult for to drum up opposition to people like that who are asking for a basic basic increase in pay and conditions. It's also very clear, and Ian, you know this, because people have been calling into your programme and the programmes of your colleagues, it's very clear that the people who are on strike, pay is just one part of it. They are desperately worried about these public services, whether it's the way tra- trains are on, whether it's the way our ambulance mm. and paramedic service is on its knees. I think one of your colleagues had a caller in yesterday, a paramedic, saying, I did not get into this prof- profession to have people, like, die mm. before Matthew, they get to something. hospital. As business, no, I mean, no one can argue with that. We all feel immensely grateful. We all wish we could give everybody everything. But I was reading today, <clears throat> you know, if you think about Mr and Mrs Smith, it's a great British business, an aggregator of independent hotels, and all the hoteliers were speaking today about the fact that they, as a result of the staff, are going to be a lot of, there are already a lot of cancelled Christmas parties, certainly half of my office are not able to come to our one in London and there are people who didn't work during Covid because hospitality was closed, restaurants and hotels were closed, who are not going to earn the money that they would use to earn over the Christmas. So I think that there's lots of hurt, again, and all of those woes are totally reasonable, but there's an enormous part now of the hospitality sector that was pretty much ruined who are now going to go through the same thing yeah. again and in the biggest I mean, week well, of I'll give you one example of what's happened. On, on Saturday the 17th, Jackie Smith and I were going to be doing a For the Many live podcast at the Hippodrome. About 300 people were going to come. Oh, everyone looking forward to it. We've had to cancel it because of the rail strike. Now, I'm sure that's not going to affect the Hippodrome's bottom line too much with what our little event. <laughs> but you multiply that <laughs> over the country. And the staff. And, that, and that's that's a really impactful situation, particularly think, around Christmas. No, no doubt, and Sorry. people making a night of it and, 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 and all the additional spend that arts and culture bring. But the way to address that is to address the strikes, negotiate, mm-hmm. um, get in there, um, agree. What the you're reforms, effectively saying is what, give in, those. aren't you? No, but you see, it isn't, it isn't giving. It's come to the table uh, and... And, and by all by all accounts, that hasn't been happening in a meaningful way in a number um, of, of sectors. I mean, it, it doesn't, it won't always uh, mean, you know, writing the checks uh, at exactly the, the the levels and the figures that are being uh, uh, bandied about. But just ignoring it and and trying to demonise the people that are going on strike isn't going to solve it either. There there is, as in most things in politics, a, a landing ground and a common ground and solution some to be found. No but you have to go out and look for it. But then, but what's interesting about it is don't. that there is public support. 
Right, we're going, to, we're going to have to move on, but before we do, a bit of breaking news. Labour MP Colin McGinn has tonight had the party whip uh, and his party membership suspended after a complaint was made against him under Labour's independent complaints process. No details of what the complaint relates to have been released. Mr McGinn says he's confident that the complaint is entirely unfounded. Well, you no doubt hear a lot more about that. Now, um, 0345 6060973, if you want to ask our panel a question over the next 45 minutes. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 18 minutes past eight on LBC. Rachel Shabby, journalist and author, is here. Matt Warman, Conservative MP. Emma Sinclair, tech entrepreneur. And Claire Hanna from the SDLP. Here to answer your questions, 0345 6060 973. Uh, right, here's one that's right up Claire Hanna Street. Tom in Seven Oaks. text question. When does the panel think Irish reunification will happen? Well, that's a big question, Tom. Tom for, for, for what, look, look, there's no doubt there's a there's a new dynamic in this in this conversation that's been created uh, primarily by by Brexit, but also um, some of the tone uh, of of GB politics over the last few years. I think people in Northern Ireland um, who have been kind of Brexited against their will, and I suppose ha have been um, essentially in the slipstream of, of conservative politics for the last few years are are um, starting to look at their options and at the moment devolution within the UK is being withheld from us as well and, and inevitably people are saying well how do I how do I enjoy good government how do I you know get the environment to run my business or raise my family or do the things that people want to do so uh, undoubtedly um, constitutional future is is on the agenda but I mean obviously um, we have to look at people's here and now as well and I think you can you can do those two things at the same time so I, I don't think uh, there's any point in in, in putting a date on, on on these things. There is a conversation being had. Clearly, um, you know, census data, uh, credible polling data is showing that as many, you know, it is a, 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 at least several years off. Um, so so uh, we can't put all of our eggs in that basket. But undoubtedly, uh, the conversation is happening. What, one of the things that is is interesting is what triggers a border a, a, a border poll. Because the, as far as I read it, it's very unclear as to what would do it. I mean, is it a series of opinion no, polls? No, it's not. It's not uh, written down. Actually, it's just in the Good Friday Agreement that power yeah. rests with the Secretary of State. Um, and and there has been a lot of kind of academic work done on, on what what should that be? Because, for example, you could say that it's um, uh, election results, but actually, parties like mine have 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 said for many years when you're voting, you know, you're not moving the border an inch in either direction, and people should be feel free to to vote in their, you know 
for for on the health service and education and on all of those um, things. And also, you don't want to correlate census um, data. So there are, there are indicators, whether it's consistent uh, kind of polling or you could put this question um, in 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 the census. I suppose it doesn't take away. There is a wee bit of an obsession about when it happens and what triggers it, rather than you know what the New Ireland will look like, how we can meaningfully change people's lives, uh, as I believe we can. I mean, you just have to look at um, the OECD data that was out uh, last week that showed the UK genuinely at the very bottom and the Republic of Ireland uh, at the very top of those uh, charts. People see a dynamic open economy. They see progressive societal change happening um, by, 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 by popular uh, opinion. And, and, and people, particularly in Northern Ireland, when we have been subjected to pretty toxic politics, um, in, many, in many ways uh, want a, a piece of that. But obviously it has to and be done by persuasion and consent. And as I say, um, you don't just shunt people into a, a move like that by... by uh, and your, your party, the SDLP, it's a nationalist party, but you can't just say because somebody is a Catholic that they're automatically going to vote to join with the Republic of Ireland or indeed the reverse. But how would you vote if there were a border poll now? I, I, well, as, as I say, we've been saying, don't have one uh, right now. It's one of those things. Do you want it done properly or do you want it um, done quickly? So, But you, you would you have, like to see a United course, Ireland in I, the long I, term. Absolutely. I, I think I think it, uh, an island of our size is, is, is logical. And by the way, um, I, I, I a new Ireland back in the European Union, which I think is is, is a very motivating um, factor for many people. But but I want it to be a new Ireland. I want it to have kind of uh, symbols and, and and an ethos and values that that people, in, including my, you know unionists and, and 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 Protestants and people who traditionally haven't been included in 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 the sense of Irishness, uh, uh, feel uh, part of that. And that won't happen uh, overnight. And as I say, what uh, we've we've hoped to do, and the Good Friday Agreement had the promise to essentially. Oh, you know, synchronise public services, kind of build up the north-south economy, join things in the border, and then you know, like like a jigsaw, you do the frame first, then you put the last bit in, and 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 you put it to the people. Um, so as I say, you should plan. We should be using uh, the the Stormont institutions and the north-south institutions to to to, to make that more so of a reality. I'll probably be dead by the time. No, I don't think you will. <laughs> as I say, if you'd asked me this question five or six years ago, I'd say, Ian, look. You know, it's decades of yeah. undoubtedly, undoubtedly, the time team has accelerated. And, and as I say, and I will name the party, it's the DUP who are, who are withholding Stormont. And I say to them uh, quite regularly, if you, if you, you, what you're saying to the most moderate people who, who believe in the Good Friday Agreement and in partnership and in compromise and in dealing with the here and now, but what you're saying to them, you, you have nowhere to go. You won't be allowed to uh, pass legislation. You won't be allowed to improve uh, the climate and, and the place you live in. Um, so people are forced. Um, to, to, to look to look okay. further down the line. Um, Emma Sinclair, often when people talk about Northern Ireland politics, I think people in Britain, their eyes start to glaze over, partly because they don't understand it, they don't understand the history of it. And, uh, I mean, I would include myself in that. I don't think that I know enough about the, the history of it. And over the last year, I've learned quite a bit more than I did before for various reasons. But, I mean, going back to the question, I mean, do you think that people in... Britain, the mainland of Britain, would really care less if there was Irish unification? Uh, I can only speak for myself. I know people on both sides of the border um, and I feel like it would be a, something to ask them and not something to ask me. I feel like Northern Ireland is You're here, that's connected. what I'm asking. I know, it's awkward, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, I'm not a politician, but I'm doing my best to avoid questions where possible. No, not really, <laughs> not really. I mean, I feel connected. You know, we do business there. I have friends there. Friends went to university there. It feels a part of my heritage and I've grown up with it being part of the United Kingdom. So to me, I think absolutely. Um, I think it's bizarre to think that nobody cares but certainly we all pay a little bit of extra closer attention to things right on our doorstep. I'm sure that's true. Can, can I just add one little thing? And we would continue to be, even in New Ireland, we will always be next door neighbours. And I think those ties uh, and bonds, many hundreds of thousands of Irish people live on this island and vice versa. And people do have a shared heritage and families are spread out across these islands. And long may that continue. I think it enriches both of us. So I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think of Irish unity as being like us kind of putting the wall up and saying, see you I don't think anyone does, but I think to myself, you know, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, sure. we have uh, all these changes that have happened uh, commercially from people a business perspective. Um, from tax perspective, from VAT perspective. Oh, my goodness, if small British businesses have to change again uh, with their rules, um, I think you'd probably make a lot of founders, CEOs, and certainly a lot of small businesses uh, very unhappy. But uh, no doubt, I shall certainly be watching extra closely, sure. uh, having learned a lot more tonight. 
Matt Warman. Uh, so I think if you uh, look at what are the challenges that Northern Ireland currently faces, they are around the day-to-day -day, uh, stuff around education, around health, around uh, not having that functioning executive. I think it would, it would not be the right thing to say the most important debate to be having right now is a constitutional argument. And, and, and I think actually there's probably a lot more consensus amongst the parties uh, on that uh, than, than perhaps this question uh, acknowledges. So, so for me, I think the UK government has a duty to the people of Northern Ireland to try and uh, make their lives better. I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that. And I think that's what we should be getting on with. Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I would include myself in that bracket of people who should know a lot more about Ireland. Um, I also think that it's, you know, whether or not we think it's the time to be having that constitutional discussion, the reality is that events have made that constitutional conversation happen. And I um, have spoken to a few people from Northern Ireland who have said, actually, the most surprising thing is, this conversation is on the table. You know, people are having it in a way that exactly as you say, a few years ago, just would have been unimaginable. And I think yeah. that in itself is quite a big statement. I, I remember probably about six, nine months ago, I was sitting in for Matt Fry on a Saturday morning. And I don't know what we were about to discuss, but somebody sent in a text about Irish unification or reunification. So I said to my producer at the time, I said, OK, let's do that as a phone-in. He said, oh, you'll never get any calls on that. I said, you just watch. Mm. And the lines went mad. Mm. I mean, it was really interesting, and it was mainly from people who weren't fitting the stereotype. It was from people Absolutely. in the Republic who were saying... Well, I'm not sure that we can really cope with Northern Ireland because we would have to subsidise them in the way that the British government does at the moment. We can't afford it. And then you had Catholics in Northern Ireland saying, don't get the impression that we all want to join with the Republic because we'd have to pay for prescriptions or, or, or doctor's visits for 50 euros a time or something. So, I mean, it, it would be a fascinating debate to have if it came to it, and I've got no idea what the result would be. People, people, are, people are diverse. They have many different, and as I say, it is it is the unexpected opinions that, that, that enrich the conversation and, and keep it uh, lively. People are also rational, and, and, and they will um, think things through for themselves, and, and, and people... Uh, kind of see the direction uh, of, 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 of travel. As I say, uh, people are entitled to know what it will look like, what it will mean for the health service, what it will mean um, for their pension, what it will mean um, for the trading environment uh, uh, and all of those things. And those are that, that falls on us, those of us who want to create that change. That's our job to start um, to set it out. But I just, the, the, the fundamental point is Brexit and particularly the way Brexit has been done to us has kind of brought us down to ground zero in terms of uh, in, in terms of, of of the economic climate, in terms of uh, relationships, and it makes uh, a lot of sense. It's, it's very logical to people to reorient on a north south basis. Imagine Emma. all those Brexit laws which uh, nobody could get their you head see, around. And, and I one point I'd just like to make, if yeah, I may, sure, for sure, one sure. second, which is just that you know it's a lot to put people through. So I listened to this from the outside for sure, but uh, people have had an enormous amount of change. And what you're basically saying is we've had a lot of change, especially for business recently and we're going to have some more, but we're not exactly sure what it will look like. But trust us, we will make sure that you know. And I have to be honest, I don't run a business that has a significant exposure there. But if I heard that, and that was after the last few years, I would be, um, well, here's, I think I would definitely yeah. have a puff and well, well, Here's the thing. We spent four or five years doing the Brexit thing, and then we came up with the protocol. And business said all along, and I worked very closely with business, look, just tell us what the rules are, and we'll work around them. So we got it's it. We didn't love, way. we didn't love, sorry, well, that's what, I'm sorry, that's what the business is. All the federations told us is they didn't love the protocol but they said let's work with it and then six months in while they had reoriented their business the protocol is removed and protocol bill that's going through parliament so actually the instability well, it hasn't is been coming it hasn't been removed the, the, the they're threatening to remove sure. it if the eu don't play ball. how do you do how do you do how do you do a one-year plan let alone a three-year mm -hmm. plan if there's a bill going through parliament that says this this difficult so well, that's, the same that's as strikes but, or anything but, else but this is, this is no no but the entire business environment is being um externally um disrupted so that, that that's the issue and people are saying but, if but that you, disruption you is accept, happening... But you accept, as the SDLP yeah. and I think Sinn Féin do as well, that there are problems with the protocol Absolutely. that need of to be course, solved, that it's not perfect, because sometimes the impression given is that everyone in Northern Ireland thinks, oh, no, it, no it's no, all well, fine. Not, not by me. I mean, Brexit is fundamentally about uh, about barriers, and it's really, really complex, marrying up 
the Brexit that Britain chose, Northern Ireland didn't, by the way, um, with the geography United that, Kingdom that, that, chose. That, that, that we have. Well, to be, I'm to just, be accurate. For, for what it's worth, Northern Ireland didn't. And, and, and as I say, uh, we rest on consent. And, and as I say, it is it is far from perfect. And, and uh, from the SDLP's uh, perspective, we have constantly uh, engaged with UK government, with the EU and with businesses to try and sand off the barnacles, as, as the former Prime Minister uh, put it. And we appreciate that it needs uh, change, but fundamentally, um, a set of mitigations okay. are going to have to be put in place. Right, we're going to move on in just a few minutes' time. It's 8.31 on LBC. Let's get the latest news headlines with Charlotte Morgan. Flights over Christmas are in doubt after Border Force staff at airports announced eight days off strikes in a row over pay, jobs and pensions. Earlier, the Prime Minister promised tough new laws to limit the impact of industrial action. Greenpeace is criticising the decision to grant planning permission for the UK's first coal mine in decades. The government says the site in Cumbria aims to be net zero, but environmentalists say it'll make climate targets harder to hit. Matt Hancock won't be standing in the next general election. The MP and former health secretary says he wants to find new ways to communicate with people. LBC weather, snow and sleet for Scotland overnight with lows of minus five. Wintry showers for northern England tomorrow, drier elsewhere with highs of six degrees. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.34 is the time on LBC. We have the journalist Rachel Shabby with us, Matt Warman, Conservative MP for Boston and Skegness, Emma Sinclair, tech entrepreneur, is chief executive of Enterprise Alumni, which is what? What does what does that do? It's software that powers alumni communities for large companies. So, you know, you've got thousands of people that work in large companies and the day they leave, it's thanks by, which is a bit bizarre because you spent all that time and money helping them and recruiting so them. Friends Reunited. So, mm, with less of the dating and more of the rehiring and business <laughs> development. Um, but no one said that to me before but i'll keep that in mind <laughs> maybe there's some dating i don't know and of about. course that failed so obviously it's nothing like friends yeah. united damn straight <laughs> uh great well let's move on to another question um i missed you out there didn't i claire claire hannah from the sdlp too um she's had most of the programs so, on, on, on northern ireland so we're going to move on to something very different now uh, paul is in liverpool hello paul 
Afternoon, uh, sorry, evening, lads. Um, great show. Uh, I'd just like to put a question to the panel, if I can, please. Sorry? I'd just like to put a question to the panel, please. Yeah, please do. Yes, um, uh, Keir Starmer, um, I'd like to know why um, he believes everybody has, has the aspiration to actually own their own home. It was on BBC News tonight, and said he's been, all these aspirations have now been destroyed. Don't you think most people do have that aspiration? Okay, but not everybody has the discipline. Uh, not everyone has the job security. Some people have zero-hour contracts and or whatever. And some, you know, um, some people just don't sit there and think about a twenty-five-year uh, commitment. Uh, some people live day by day, and you know. Uh, so it was just in reference okay. reference going on to council accommodation and councils taking the lead for rented accommodation really uh, especially now that lots of older people seem to be living on their own alright alright Paul let's go to the panel um, Emma Sinclair ho home ownership has always been seen as a, as a, 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 a positive aspiration mm. but home ownership percentages have fallen over the past 10 years yeah, uh, well, I can only speak for the lads, as the question was asked. But um, I mean, I think Keir Starmer talked minority. about yes, exactly. The lads are, are the smaller minority this evening. Um, uh, have a, people, do people have an aspiration to own their own home? I think if you're making a political speech um, in a very short amount of time, my experience is there's only so much you can say and you're effectively trying to speak for the masses. I think it's probably safe to say that there are lots of people that aspire to do that. My family came here as refugees about 100 years ago. There was absolutely no possibility of that happening and, and it's been a, it was a family aspiration from day one. No doubt, as, as, as the gentleman at school dinner said, there are some people on the outliers, there are some people who can't do that. I think aspiration in general, though, is an extremely important thing for the British economy and so using the word aspiration whether it's for a home or whether it's for education or whether it's for it's anything that gives you a step forward in life is something that we should all definitely firmly implant um, on children at school on, on young adults so it might not be that that's the aspiration of absolutely everybody but I suspect uh, Keir was just speaking for the masses Rachel I don't know about that to be honest I think that what people <coughs> probably aspire to is stability and affordability of the place where they live and they'd like to call home. And perhaps that has been translated as home ownership in the UK, but perhaps that's because actually renting in the UK market is fundamentally quite a nasty experience. Um, you know, you're at the mercy of... Not for everybody. Well... At the moment, even the majority. I at the say. moment, the picture's looking quite bleak. We've had record evictions, and you know, rent rents are spiralling, and the quality of housing available to people is really quite bad. And people don't want to make a fuss because then they'll but be. You, evicted. you say that because you 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 will pick on the, the worst examples, and obviously there are bad examples of bad landlords and bad, bad housing. But I would like to think that the majority of people listening to this programme who are renting will say, no, actually, I'm quite happy with my house and no, the accommodation and, and, and my landlord. Great. And that's great. But I, I may be wrong. But I, I don't know, me, but I, I suspect... Not but, me. I, but I suspect that if I were offered the choice or if somebody was offered the choice of, OK, do you want a 10-year secure lease or a 20-year secure lease on your rent or do you want to own a home? I'd be interested in the answer to that question because I suspect what people are seeking when they seek home ownership is stability. And I know that's how I felt when I mm. owned a home quite late in life after years and years and years of renting. That feeling of stability, I had no idea how much of my energy and anxiety was being taken up with worrying about renting and being evicted or, you know, just that insecurity. It just takes up so much of your life and your energy. So I suspect the stability is what people are after. And that might take different forms with better protections for renters, uh, better terms and more affordable rents. Matt Warman. I, I agree with a lot of that, actually. I think, I think sort of political speech tends to use shorthand for really complicated ideas. And, and home ownership is often a shorthand for stability and economic security and all of those things that we might want. No one's here to try and force people uh, into 
buying houses, what we should be doing as a government is making sure that there is enough supply out there, that there is enough economic opportunity for people to have that security. What, what I think is true, though, is that large numbers of people who would like to be able to buy a home simply can't because the supply hasn't been there for, for many, many years under governments of various different colours. And that is a really pressing issue uh, that governments of many colours have tried to address with varying degrees of success. Well, no success at all, to be fair, because w w when I was in my 20s, if you were on an average salary, you could afford a mortgage yeah. three times your salary. Nobody on an average salary now can buy a home. They, yeah. they can't get on the bottom rung of the ladder. It's quite true. That, that's that's uh, the so, problem, isn't so, it? So, so, so mm. uh, to put it in perspective, that is absolutely true in the South East. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, if you look at a constituency like mine where you can get perfectly decent housing, new or old, for 60, 70, 80,000. Not, not glamorous, I'm not pretending that, that, that it is, um, but that first rung on the ladder mm. is much more available outside the South East than it is elsewhere. And that's part of that levelling up rhetoric that we hear, which is, which is in some ways the most uh, challenging shorthand for, for political speech. So I think we've got to be realistic about it and say this is largely about building large numbers, larger numbers of houses in the places where people want to live. And that is very often in the UK in the South East. So, so that is such really a shame challenging. that the government abolished all of the targets so people can actually afford houses in those areas. Well, I th I look, I think we can we can have an argument about whether a housing target is a sufficient thing to fix the challenges that the well, housing market gonna faces. Well, it's never going to fix it on its own. It's, 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 exactly. Exactly. The local councils exactly. now have a get-out-of-jail-free card, well, don't so, they? So, so I think, uh, on the other hand, I do think it is right to say that elected councillors in parts of the country where there is huge pressure on housing should have a really significant say in what houses go where, because they know, in particular... Yeah, for and, instance, they're, and they'll all say... None. We don't want any because well, that, that, that's, because that's, our, our voters won't, uh, well, that, won't that's, allow that's, it. History simply does not back up that position. They might say different things uh, to what a central government target might recognise, but we know uh, that, for instance, people feel really acutely the pain of their children and their grandchildren not being able to live in the areas mm. that they've grown up. So, so I think it's it's, it's unfair I, I to characterise every back single to your constituency and ask every single Conservative councillor in your area. Would you, would you like to take 50 new houses in your ward? And I guarantee you that every single one of them would come back and say no. I can point you to councillors in my constituency where they have taken hundreds of houses in yeah, their ward. Willingly? And, and that it, willingly? Willingly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that is partly simply because mine well, is a big rural constituency. Boston uh, in, is in more Lincoln. enlightened than maybe and, I thought it was. Well, so, so I, I, that is a very unfair <laughs> characterisation of a fantastic part of the world. Uh, but, I, look, you, you're absolutely right. There are huge differences in this debate debate between a constituency such as mine and a constituency in the heart of London. Uh, and and, and recognising that difference is A, important, and I would argue to some extent best done by giving genuine power uh, to okay. a, a devolved settlement. Um, Claire Hannah, two friends of mine have moved to Northern Ireland because they can afford a house there. Uh, is that is that a phenomenon, that people moving to the UK for that reason? Oh, well, from you the will, UK? You, you will find that salaries in the main are lower as well. And I think so I should say from Britain, Britain because it's, Northern Ireland is in the UK. Well, that you see, look. It's so a, some, yeah. somebody, somebody's going to have a go at me if Rewind I don't... Rewind the tape sort of from the earlier show. Let them tweet in. There is undoubtedly, I mean, I think in, in both Britain and Ireland, a, 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 you know, a high levels of home ownership, which are partly called but partly because I think the the, the context for, for for renting isn't as, as hospitable it, or as it is uh, in, for example, the European mainland, where there are maybe rent controls or there are more security uh, of tenure. So I think it's a very natural thing for people to aspire to. And, and Rachel's right to say there's probably uh, people want security and stability. And if you're going to you know make a home and invest in it, of course people want that to be their own, um, whether because they like what they've done with it or if they're going to put money uh, into it. And ultimately. You you know, in most cases, if you're privately renting, you are paying a mortgage. It's just not yeah. your own. But the mm. issue is, of course, um, the disconnect and how, how far out of reach uh, for people uh, that, that it is. And it's just, it's a massive generational injustice. You know, younger people coming out now, it's just completely far beyond the reach, including in Northern Ireland, by the way. And, and um, uh, you know, that, that gap between, you don't need me to repeat the figures, but, you know, the, the average salary and, and getting um, a, a, a foothold um, on the ladder, let alone in, in, in the place where they want to live, maybe that is, uh, you know, 
close to their their own connections or, or close to um, their, their work or, or whatever. Not um, even just young people. Well, I mean, well, this, I can't well, afford. I'm, I'm, in two weeks' time, I've got a bad landlord, a bad rental, uh, a bad agent. But I'm moving further listening. away. I hope they are. And you know, on, you know, entrepreneurs and business. Even if you own a, a large business, you can't get a mortgage. I'm going further out because I can't afford to either rent or buy mm. commensurate with the area near my parents, near my grandma. Um, it's very, very hard. Um, although I'm not moving to Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, and, and I think I won't take that as an answer. I think, I think, I think, I think, I think uh, part of it it starts absolutely uh, with building them, building um, sufficient homes of, of various types. But also, we we do need to stop looking at housing as a, a kind of an investment market mm. and start looking at it as, as a place to you know it's people's homes yeah. um, as the primary function of of, of housing. Um. Matt, you're being fact-checked by one of our listeners. Mm. Uh, James in Lincoln says, right move must be broken, as I've just checked Matt Warman's facts, and there appears to be about three houses for sale in the whole of his constituency within the price range he quoted. Is this the new I'm, I'm, what's the price I will, I will happily check it myself again. <laughs> uh, but, but look, the, the, the fact is that, I mean, I, we could have a separate debate about the relative expense of living in Lincoln versus it, living in Skegness or Boston or towns in between the two, um, where, where the prices are, are significantly lower. But the reality is also, as Claire sort of says, the wages are significantly lower. So there is a real challenge on there in attracting higher paid jobs, higher skilled mm. employment, and then making that commensurate with being able to afford a house. Because in, in the southeast, by and large, wages are higher and property prices are even higher. Uh, so, so there's a lot to be going on with, but I, I'll check out right move and come back to you in a few minutes. Yes, but don't forget, there is all this remote work since COVID, so I hear that and I think to myself, we have so many people that work miles and miles from the office spread out throughout the United Kingdom. So, so I absolutely hear that point, but I suppose one of the great things about you know business and, and a result of COVID in some ways is the fact that people's salaries are really changing. Right, Real we, opportunity to regenerate kind of rural and kind of under-resourced areas where people can live in them and still have and that, a kind that of job. that actually is happening. Yeah. You've got micro-businesses starting up in former commuter towns where they, they still want the sort of a sandwich lunch, so you've got, you've got sandwich shop, mobile sandwich shops now operating, yeah. which wouldn't have happened before COVID. Right, we have many more questions to get through, but only 13 minutes to do so. It's 8.47. LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Rachel Shabby, Matt Warman, Emma Sinclair and Claire Hannah with us answering your questions. Let's go to Ben in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Uh, good evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. Hi. The question is, uh, would uh, draconian new laws to ban strikes work in this country? Matt Warman, just in 30 seconds, explain what these, in uh, inverted commas, draconian new laws are. So the suggestion, for instance, uh, is on the underground in some uh, areas such as the NHS, we might have laws that replicate those that we have for the police, which means that there is a limited uh, minimum kind of service uh, that prevents strike action. And when I look at uh, people saying ambulances going on strike means that people that have fallen over and broken their hips are going to be on the floor for 12, 24 hours, I think that seems well, entirely are. fair yeah. to me. It, making it worse is inexcusable. Um, so are, are these laws actually going to ban strikes or just say, well, you can strike, but you still have to provide a minimum level so of it, cover? So it, pr it proposes a minimum level of service in, in, right. in, exa in exactly the, the, that way. Now, I think industrial action is an important part of the process and, and, and that right to protest on, on, on some level is, is really valuable. But I do think if you go into a job such as the police, it is not that different to going into a job such as the ambulance service, uh, such as the, uh, the uh, transport network in a place like London. So I think putting down those basic uh, minimum standards it is not unreasonable. And you look at the damage that is done by some of those strikes to people's lives and livelihoods, uh, and this is not, uh, not an unreasonable proposal. Rachel. Um, two things. First of all, it's already very difficult to strike. You need a ballot and you need a high percentage of your voters, to, uh, your members to support that ballot. Secondly, and as you know, because people have been calling in and saying so, a strike is a last resort. Nobody wants to go on strike. You're taking no wages. Um, you're facing the unpopularity of government and its cheerleaders and the press demonising you. The trouble for you, though, is that public support is holding up for strikers. I've been talking to unions and they are overwhelmed by the level of support It's that true, Matt. Had. I mean, I, I will tell you from the phone-ins... Yep. OK, I can't say that every single person yeah. who phones into no. LBC is representative of the country, but over the past few months when there have been different strikes, I've been very surprised mm. at the solidity of the support, particularly on the railways, which... I mean, you and I remember strikes really? back in, the, in sort of 10, 20 years ago when most people literally hated the RMT and as if that is no longer... The case. So, so look, I think on one level, time will tell when this stuff really starts to bite. Will that will that uh, solidity be maintained? Uh, as I say, well, the only thing we we can do is wait and see. But I do think at the end of the day, some of these strikes are about different issues to others and some of them are about really large levels of pay rises rather than primarily about conditions. It has to be horses for courses. I think it's reasonable to look at what uh, a minimum kind of level of service is. Okay. And if I, if I just take one example, for instance, I was supposed to, I, I was talking to a plumber today who, because the Royal Mail is to some extent on strike, he can't go to work because the part that was supposed to show up simply hasn't shown up. Now, I can tell you for certain he's not that sympathetic to those strikers. Okay. Yeah. Emma? Yeah, things need to keep moving. Um, COVID, businesses closing, small businesses have collapsed, which are the lifeblood of our economy. Big businesses are struggling too. Um, so you said public support, um, and there's public support for strikers. There's clearly public sympathy, um, but I think um, some degree of keeping moving is not just vital, but absolutely essential. And I would be extremely sorry to see absolutely nothing um, from any of the sectors that are talking about stopping completely. So I think the idea of a, like a minimum viable product, the idea of uh, some steps, some coverage is, um, for me, essential for me to maintain the sympathy that I have. But it wouldn't work in on the railways, for example, would it? Because if, if say, 10% of the trains were running, it, it wouldn't well, actually have Well, you say much that, impact. like at Christmas, my business will slow down, but we'll have a certain number of engineers and a certain number of developers and some people that will work on the phones. And, and you know, so you make sure you have coverage for the absolute essential, as, as Matt said, such as with the police. It's perfectly possible in all the other industries. And I, as I said, I have lots of sympathy and we'd like to give everybody everything they want, just like I do in my business. I want everybody to have absolutely everything they ever dreamed of. But there's a, a public person 
worse and B, there's a need to keep moving forward for the economy. So people are going to complain if the economy doesn't grow. The economy can only grow if some people go to work. And people are paid properly. Uh, well, That's exactly. how the economy the, grows. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the economy can't, can't grow if, if people literally uh, can't make ends meet and they, they don't have a, a, any sort of disposable income. But but ultimately, if banning the strikes is at best a sticking plaster and it is fundamentally failing to, to deal with the, the underlying issues and, and what is driving people to feel the withdrawing their labour is the only option. We spoke about uh, ambulances and, and that mm. case of the man who said he, he spent seven hours hearing other calls coming in in the radio, unable to help them uh, with somebody who needed admitting so preventing preventing him from striking isn't addressing the, the crumbling public services that, that have question. been a long time. The question time. is, you know, well, what should fine. we do so, about this? Well, there so is, we I, mean, I don't stop. mean to be flippant, there, there is a word in forcing people uh, to go to work, uh, to go to their work uh, against their will. So I, I think it would suit the government better uh, rather than, 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 than banning the ability to, to, to strike, to, to address the underlying issues. Um, th- and they have right. common calls. I want to fit one that. more question in, and we've got about two and a half minutes, so if you can all bear that in mind and the length mm. of your answers. Uh, not an easy one to answer in short, short answers. So Joseph in Preston, with the approval of a new coal mine in West Cumbria, has the lie that is the government's net zero agenda finally been laid bare? Rachel? Yes, it has. Um, the government's own climate advisers, I believe, told it that this would damage the capacity to meet net zero. And it's just staggering that the government is pursuing these stupid, dumb, old, dangerous energy sources when there is so much to do with renewable energies, which would also be job creation programmes as well. It is just plain dumb. Matt. At this point, utter nonsense. Um, so, so look, th- this is a very specific ki- kind of coal that will be imported from other countries if we don't mine it in this country. This is not about going back to coal-fired power stations for straightforward energy generation. Your choice here is simply between: do you increase the carbon footprint of energies making steel, of, of industries making steel, and that sort of thing in this country, or do you do it? in the UK by mining it, creating jobs as a transitional thing while we are moving towards uh, that green future which we already see creating thousands of jobs on the Humber in the southwest and elsewhere. Claire. Look, there's no e- easy answers on, on energy generation, particularly in the in the context of, of Russia and the decisions that is forced. But but this is not the the, the correct one. Um, it's kind of penny wise, pound foolish, both in terms of um, spend and in terms of, as you say, transforming our our our, our energy supply. It's taking uh, one step backwards. Yes, there. I mean, there there's there's almost no uh, fossil fuels that you can have that don't have some uh, human rights uh, implications. But this will this will push us further away from kind of a, a, a green targets and it will probably divert investment from some of the um, more sustainable and and ultimately more efficient uh, sources in the future. Emma? Uh, I know absolutely nothing about that decision and I have been a vegan for 25 years which I think gives me some serious credibility in terms of commitment to the environment. I will say um, yeah yeah, thanks uh, just dropping that (laughs) in there Um, (laughs) but um, I imagine there must be some rationale for it and there must be something to think about so before I was to jump on and say that sounds like a terrible idea it would like in almost all important things in life probably be sensible to have a look at why was that decision made so I'm afraid I'm not uh, you're giving the government a lot more credit than they deserve that just time for our final (laughs) fun text question from Jenny in Woodbridge panel a scenario for you. Matt Hancock is coming to you for some career advice. <laughs> what would you advise him to do with his life after Parliament? I'm looking forward to these answers. Emma. Oh, God, I wish I was going last. Uh, I think uh, he probably needs to take a little bit of a break. I always think sometimes when you've had a really busy time that's been pretty intensive, um, and I think about that from my perspective, doing five different things at once. It sounds like he's been doing five different things at once. You should probably take a breather and have some time to reflect. Go up the Himalayas, have a little think about uh, the meaning of life and what you want to achieve. Don't That's rush into anything. That's what he was supposed anything. to do in the jungle, wasn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, I don't know. I didn't watch that, I'm afraid to say, but um, I'm sure that eating bugs and something else was probably a bit, probably not so helpful in contemplating Claire. life. I'm looking well, forward to Claire's advice. Uh, well, first things first, I'd say you're, you're on the payroll in your current job uh, at the moment for at least another year or two, so you need to um, uh, get stuck in like everybody else. Else and do the one that you're being paid uh, fairly handsomely for. But of course, people should uh, do to the best of their ability what makes them uh, happy and, and, and what they're good at. I, I didn't like the inference that he's he's doing reality TV to connect people to politics. I think if, if you think the only way to connect people to politics is to go on 
you know, eat cows bums or whatever, um, that then we've got uh, that we've got a problem. Um, uh, but you know, obviously, he 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 clearly wants to make some money, and he's entitled to try and do that. Um, well, he says he wants to communicate, learn to communicate with people in a different way. Um, Rachel, I would like him to communicate in bat signals that the human ear cannot hear. <laughs> Preferably. That's a bit harsh just before Christmas. Um, I just think it's awful the way that Matt Hancock is rewarded for failure, failing up, upwards in that classic way, and I think it's particularly insulting to the families of uh, the bereaved who lost loved ones during COVID. Matt? Look, there's, there's nothing in it for me to defend Matt Hancock, but I would say simply that this is someone who, when confronted with the immensely difficult challenges that COVID presented, did his absolute okay, best. That's not the question. What would your career advice and, be and, now? And, 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 I, and I think uh, I would hope that his future career reflects the fact that he played a pivotal role in an immensely difficult time for this country. And if we erase all the credit he deserves for that, then that is not a great reflection. So he should go and run a PPE firm? Matt can make up his own mind about his future, but I think this, uh, this idea that everything that was bad that happened during COVID he made worse is the opposite of the truth. Can you make clear that it was not you who fo who's texted in in the last hour to say that you find Matt Hancock sexy because it was somebody called oh. Matt? I have not yet been driven to do that. No, uh, I can, I can say with 100%. Right, <laughs> thank you very much indeed to all of you for coming on the show. Rachel Shabby, <laughs> Matt Warman, who now regrets it, uh, Emma Sinclair <laughs> and Claire <laughs> Hannah. In a moment, we're going to be talking about the Elgin Marbles. The uh, new culture secretary says returning the Elgin Marbles to Greece would be a dangerous and slippery road. Do you agree with her? One minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock... Flights over Christmas are set to face disruption after UK airport border force staff announced eight days of strikes in a row over pay, jobs and pensions. Earlier, the Prime Minister promised tough new laws to limit the impact of industrial action. 